they were a fairly new church. In fact, Paul had never even got to visit there yet. And with the Holy Spirit's direction, it was also obviously written to remind us to put Christ first. Put Jesus first. Christ is the one we preach. And back in the mid-70s, there was a movement in the evangelical churches to train Christian church members on how to evangelize their circles of influence. <clears throat> there was a seminary professor, uh, Dr. Oscar Thompson, he uh, junior, right here in Fort Worth at Southwestern Baptist Seminary is where he taught. He was teaching so something called concentric circles of concern. Now, if you were Southern Baptist, you definitely knew what this was, but other churches also picked up on that at that time. And he taught this at various conferences and the like, and, and all those seminary students that he had had and all those conference attendees were supposed to take these easy steps, simple steps, back to their own churches and have little classes and little trainings on them. Um, and he, all, all these things in his teachings were finally published in a book just before he uh, died of cancer in 1980. And then because of this, I mean, because he had done this, evangelism had waned before because of churches trying to rely more and more on paid staff and professional pastors and evangelists uh, to tell others about Jesus uh, and to bring people into the pews and, and to get regular members. The regular members of the churches were feeling ill-equipped. And so his teachings were helping uh, equip again maybe the regular members of the church to share the gospel. So the idea was to make sharing the gospel easy. And the first idea was to start in your most immediate circles of influence. And of course, the first circle was you. With prayer and Bible reading and devotion and worship, you were supposed to be aligning yourself with Jesus. And that's, that's obvious. I mean, that makes sense. And next was your immediate family. Those people that you had mo the most contact with over and over and over. Those people needed to know about Jesus in your life and how, how you were trying to stay close to Jesus. And, and you wanted them to know and you wanted them to become Christian as well. And then next it would be your extended family and your friends. And then the next circle would be your co-workers and, and then your neighbors and then your community. And of course then later the larger world at large. Is, if Jesus is really your Lord then... He should be your Lord over every part of your life, including those relationships. And that was what the, the influence was supposed to be about. And this was all, excuse me, and this was all well and good, unless you are attending some church that was more interested in controlling your life and the legalism. You've heard them. Don't dance, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't drink, don't, out, don't go out with girls who do. And I got that one right. The last one I got pretty good. I didn't, I didn't go. Yeah, that was easy for me. Your relationship with Jesus was usually defined by your adherence to their rules. Which often, sometimes, didn't have any direct basis from the Bible. And if someone was outside of those sticky legalistic rules, then often they were excluded. MCC's own Reverend Elder Mel White says... Uh, you don't have to be gay or lesbian to feel like an outcast. Fundamentalist Christians have made people outcast by the color of their skin, by their race and religion, by their sex, their sexual orientation, their gender identity. When I was a child, my home church made outcasts out of smokers, drinkers, dancers, rock and roll listeners, moviegoers, television watchers, long hairs, hippies, divorcees, unmarried bachelors and spinsters, Roman Catholics, liberal Protestants, pagans, atheists, and agnostics. And he was going on with his list. He continues, he says, even those families who miss church by spending an occasional weekend at their mountain cabin were made to feel like outcasts when they returned the following Sunday. Fundamentalists in the 21st century are the equivalent of the first century Pharisees who knew the law by heart but had forgotten that love is the heart of the law. And even myself, I can remember when I couldn't wear shirts above my knees or my hair had to be above my collar and girls were limited on how much makeup they could wear. And, and I can't remember how many times we had to boycott Disney for some reason or another. I mean, over and over and over, it seemed like that. So this... Then this concentric circles of con uh, concern, this evangelism, this sometimes morphed into what was called uh, lifestyle evangelism. 
And in lifestyle evangelism, it calls Christians to live in this attractive, winsome, holy life that captures the attention of your neighbors and co-workers, and then you would earn a chance to share the gospel. You'd be such a good boy or gal that everyone would want to know what is your secret. That reminds me of an old, another commercial that was, because I was looking at old commercials. I'm sorry I did that, but I remember an old commercial, the old Calgon water softener commercial. Here's this woman, she goes into the cleaners and she's picking up her clothes and she says, um, how do you get your shirt so clean, Mr. Lee? And this Asian guy, very stereotypical, he smiles and he says, ancient Chinese secret. And his wife is behind the scenes and she, she says, here's his ancient, he's such a hot shot, here's his ancient Chinese secret. She picks up a box of Calgon water softener and she says, when you mix Calgon water softener with your own detergent, it gets clothes cleaner. Then right as that customer was about to leave the shop, Mr. Lee's wife sticks her head out and spoils his secret by saying, Honey, we're going to need more Calgon. Lifestyle evangelism meant that you were living such a perfect life that others would see it and wish that they were like you. And then you would say, it's all because of Jesus. With a little bit of humility, right? Jesus was my ancient Christian secret. But the problem with that was Christian lives aren't always perfect, are they? Again, that legalism and the hierarchy in churches would elevate those who are wealthy, well-adjusted, perfectly manicured lawns, perfect kids, basically Stedford wives like robots as real Christians that God was certainly blessing and anyone with real problems, real struggles, obstacles, failures, sickness, whatever, any sort of blemish, they must not be living the Christian life. I see some heads nodding on that. (coughs) Richard Rohr said, Christianity is a lifestyle, a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared, and loving. However, we made it into an established religion and all that goes with that and avoided the lifestyle change itself. One can be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish, and vain in most of Christian history and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Lord and Savior. The world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on earth is too great. I agree. Another writer said, and what I'm willing to do which the mainstream church is not, is to denounce the Christian right as Christian heretics. You don't have to, as I did, spend three years at Harvard Divinity School to realize that Jesus didn't come to make us rich. He certainly didn't come to make Pat Robertson and Joel Olstein rich. And what they have done is acculturate the worst aspects of American capitalism, imperialism, chauvinism, violence, and bigotry into the Christian religion. Now, the Apostle Paul was dealing with something similar things in the early church. He was dealing with Jewish legalism mixed on with a little bit of mysticism. There was also the idea that what you did in your body was not that important because the spirit was more important and that avoiding suffering was admirable. And Paul was writing this letter to them from the Roman prison. Having been beaten multiple times for the gospel of Jesus imprisoned multiple times for his teaching about Jesus, he suffered severely, and he said he was happy to do it for Jesus' sake. In fact, in verse 24, we read already, he says, I am happy because of what I'm suffering for you. My suffering joins with and continues the suffering of Christ. I suffer for his body, which is the church. I serve the church. God appointed me to bring the complete word of God to you. That word contains the mystery that has been hidden for many ages, but now it is made made known to the Lord's people. God has chosen to make known to them the glorious riches of that mystery and has made it known among the Gentiles. And here's what it is. Christ in you. Christ in you. He is our hope and glory. Christ is the one we preach about. With all wisdom we have, we warn and teach everyone. 
When we bring them to God, we want them to be like Christ. We want them to be grown up as people who belong to Christ. That's what I'm working for. I work hard with all the strength of Christ. His strength works powerfully in me. But you know, we have to look at the beginning of our passage to see what Christ Paul was talking about. What Christ was to Paul talking about. And this is where we get into a little bit of juicy stuff. Now, if you've been watching TV in any bit at all, from any side of the channel of the political spectrum at all, you've seen lots of talk about the January 6th Capitol attack and the committee hearings. And the word sedition is used often. It's been thrown around a lot. And in almost all of our conversations, almost every news being has used the word sedition. Whether you're on that, when you're against it or not, or whatever around, there's that word there. And Paul starts off with a poem. That's likely part of their communion liturgy in their communion. It probably was supposed to be used in their communion liturgy. And in the start of the poem, in verse 15, he says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was, was and created, is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Now, one commentator I was trying to read said that this point that Paul write is jaw-droppingly sedition. In doing so, Paul was making a bold claim with it. In fact, he insists that to read this in the context of the Roman Empire, this imagination of the Roman Empire, this engenders a seditious imagination. Now, while the Romans who ruled over the Colossians consider most of them Roman citizens, Paul addressed them as holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just Roman citizens, they were brothers and sisters in Christ. And while the Roman Empire believed the Colossians Christians belonged to Rome, the apostle asserted that they do not belong just to Rome, they belong to Jesus Christ. And that was more important. They may be Romans, but they are Christians first. And he insisted that Paul also insisted that Christ's identity that leads to loyalty lies in this. And among other things, Christ as the image of the invisible God. Well, of course, when you look at Rome, anything about Rome, you would always see the Roman emperor's face on all the coins and statues everywhere around. They were the image of God. That's who was supposed to be the image of God. And Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The images of Caesar doted the empire's landscape. Among other things, those images were supposed to remind people, especially those who lived far away from Rome, that, that Caesar was in charge of everything around them. And Paul's saying, no, Jesus is. And against that backdrop, Paul insisted that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the apostle as he asserts the visible God seen in Christ. So those who wish to know what God is like which should first look at God's Son, Jesus Christ. Look at his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection serve to remind the contemporaries of who Jesus was, among the other things, that he was in charge of both heaven and earth. Now, by describing Christ as God, the apostle contradicts the empire's claim about itself. Roman Caesar after all, considered himself to be the son of God, if not God himself. And as a result, he believed he deserved his subjects' veneration and, and worship. Few modern leaders claim divine status today for themselves, luckily. But people remain persistently tempted to offer some of them godlike loyalty. We see that all the time. And perhaps no realm is more prone to such worship than the political area. But also, I would say some of the religious area, too. Some of these religious leaders, and I, I've been reading sometimes, some of them falling from huge, you know, be, getting caught with their secretary or getting caught uh, stealing money or all the kinds of things, or just saying some outlandish things. Some of these religious leaders, and people are propping them up like they're, I mean, giving them millions of dollars and giving them television and giving them word over and control over their lives. And these religious leaders don't deserve that either. This allegiance some Christians offer to some religious groups and political groups, it wanders dangerously into worship. And Paul challenges humanity's nature to identify and, and have loyalty toward these things. Well, that's some way maybe seditious. 
He doesn't incite his readers to form any sort of violence, though. The Apostle Paul instead reminded Christians of all the times and places that through Jesus, God offers a loving and gracious way forward for God's dearly beloved people. It's not the way of any form of violence. It's instead the way of a sacrificial and humble service of God and our neighbors. That's our mission. That's what we are to be preaching. That's the Christ we are to preach. One that serves others. One that does for others. One that loves beyond our walls. That's the Christ we are to be preaching. Let's pray. God, help us to be your humble servants. Help us to look for the ways of Christ and to align ourselves with that. God, as we look to Christ, we do see you as the visible God, who you are, who you're represented, what your spirit tells us about you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I want to thank you for your giving and your regular giving. Many of you have kind of found ways to give regularly through our online giving. Some of you uh, continue to give as you come each Sunday. Uh, are you mailing your checks? We, we thank you for that. That helps us plan and serve our community better. Um, we do know that as things are getting tighter around our world, and especially locally here, uh, we see things getting financially tighter for others. Our Benevolence Fund is one of the ways that we can help others. And so if you know someone that's going through something and uh, you think that we might can help even a small portion toward that, let me know that. We want to we be a, available to help because that's one of our ways of loving beyond ourselves is with our money and serving others. So we want to, if you know of someone, please uh, let me know and we'll uh, let the board be able to uh, find a way to help them. And if we can't help them personally or not, we can't help them enough, I'll certainly help them find other places to go. Let's uh, read our confession aloud, please. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. If you're at home, you're welcome to join us in communion. Uh, you can use whatever elements you may have. Um, if you just got simple bread and water, you're welcome to use that. Uh, or cracker and juice or uh, milk and a cookie. Whatever you want to use because we're just representing Christ's body and blood. We're doing this as a group to remember Christ. And so nothing is not sacred. Remember, Jesus took whatever he had at his table, whatever was in reach, to demonstrate that this was his body his blood that he shared. So we want to enjoy, invite you to do that. And if you're here in, in the congregation, you're welcome to join us by grabbing one of the prepackaged things. We've had the opportunity to hear God's word today and to say our confession aloud and in our hearts. In the name of God, our creator, Christ the child, and the Holy Spirit, our comforter guide, I offer you God's forgiveness. Go and forgive likewise. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he had gathered disciples together. They were sharing in this meal. And he took a piece of bread from the meal and he said, this is my body. And he blessed it. And God, we thank you for this. And he said, this is given for you. Take and eat. And then he broke it and he passed it among them. And then he took a cup of wine, fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood. It is blood of a new covenant. It is freely poured out for you. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, remember me. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to share in Christ's precious body and blood. We pray, God, that you bless these elements here. And those at home, God, may you bless whatever they're using to represent your precious body and blood. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let's repeat the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. 
Beloved, we have what we call an open communion. All MCC churches around our world has no restrictions on who can receive this communion. It doesn't matter whether you, this is your first time here or you've been here several times. If you're watching online and you've never done this before, you're still welcome to join us in this time. Because this is a communion of saints. And we're only doing what Christ asks us. When we gather together, we're supposed to remember him. And this is one of the ways we do that. To represent his body and blood so freely given for us. So as we take his body and blood, we share today. God, we thank you for the opportunity to um, share in this communion of saints, this communion with you, O oh Lord, as we receive of Christ, his willingness to give of himself to us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. A couple of announcements. Uh, we do have uh, the Back to Schools, LBTQ Saves Back to Schools list. Uh, that is some things we need. If you have, especially uh, for teenagers, uh, they want things uh, like deodorant and, and uh, young adult uh, colognes and perfumes, things like that that they can use for hygiene, but also, but also basics as well. Soap and also uh, uh, feminine products, any things like that so that the, the, women can ha the girls can have those things. Um, we want to make sure those are happening. Also, the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce is having a backpack giveaway uh, and anything that you bring next week, uh, and they have a list there, notebook paper, they're normal things, pencils, pens, um, tape, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Any of those normal things, paper, uh, we'll bring those things here, and we'll have them here, and we'll leave them for them, but we need them by next week. So if you're bringing anything, make sure you bring them by next week so that we can give those things out and get it to them for the 1st of August. All right, let's stand for our final song together. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Praise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is Inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar and up from the ashes hope will rise death is defeated the king is alive I sing a little louder Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. 
Louder than my unbelief Sing a little louder My weapon is a melody Sing a little louder Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise And death is defeated The king is alive Mass tour glasses sorry <laughs> you'd think we'd have this worked out by now after a year and a half of this god we pray that you uh, continue to look after us guide us this week as we are your people in a world that needs to know a true representation of christ god i am i know that i fail i know that i'm not uh, not who you call me to be completely but god may you work in me may it be your magic that transforms others not me, not something I've done, not something I say. It's because I allow you to work in me. In Jesus' holy name, amen.